But there's something else exciting that I really wanted to share with you today that will add to the things that I said in the last video. And if you haven't seen the last video, it really got a lot of views and people just loved it. So I'm hoping and praying that you'll like to listen to this one too. So one of the things that I did not talk about yet was that the scripture that is read at the time of Elul is Psalm 27. And that happens to be one of the psalms that I actually wrote music to. And it has a melody. Um, and I, I just loved it so much. And it says that Psalm 27 is read each day from the beginning of Elul through Hoshana Rabbah, which is the last day of Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. And interesting that Elul is an Akkadian word meaning harvest. So it's the time of the harvest, and this would make sense with the resurrection rapture as well, having that meaning. And in Aramaic, the root verb means to search. And the Lord said that we should seek him with all our heart. And if we seek him, we will find him. And if we knock, the door will be open to us. So if we're seeking him at the time of Elul, and the door of heaven is opened on Rosh Hashanah, when the king came down, then this is probably the time that he would come in, in the rapture resurrection and while we are waiting and watching for our bridegroom like the ten wise virgins that have the oil the olive oil in our lamps which I told you that revelation came from Galilee Green which is considered the best olive oil from Israel and you were hearing the revelations as you know the Holy Spirit had been revealing to me and I was telling you so you were listening and you were hearing it through the power of the Holy Spirit that unveiled the things of the olive oil that is the Holy Spirit so you do have oil in your lamps and if we um, ask seek knock the door will be open to you so we're searching at this time which is the meaning of Elul in Aramaic and he will open the door the door of heavens considered open at Rosh Hashanah as I told you and that's when I realized that Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan River when heaven was opened on Feast of Trumpets and it was announcing that the king suddenly appeared in the field and he was being baptized with the Holy Spirit descending and staying on him incidentally the month of Elul is the month of redemption. So that's interesting. Now isn't that astonishing that I told you that Jesus was born on Tishri 1, which is Feast of Trumpets, and that he came down on the King's Coronation Day, and he appeared suddenly on the King's Coronation Day and was baptized as heaven was opened. But he came to redeem the world, and redemption is the meaning of the month of Elul on the Hebrew calendar. And redemption, by definition, actually means the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. So the Messiah, the King of Israel, came at the time of Feasted Trumpets to redeem his people, in all the world from their sin, error, and evil. And this is really extraordinary to add this to what I told you in the last video. So the king appeared suddenly at the Jordan River and he was there to save the world from its sin. And the month of Elul also points to the future, to a future redemption because we know that the king is going to appear suddenly in the rapture and take the believers in him and his covenant with us through his blood and sacrifice and resurrection 
and we will be caught up together in the clouds. Now, I talked all about those clouds of Elul and the divine revelation of that connecting to the rapture. And it was extraordinary. So put that with the other part of this is that um, there remains in the hearts of all observant Jews the hope of a future redemption to come in the form of the Messiah of Israel. And as this time draws near, I told you that I believed that these things were revealed for this time right now because we're getting close. These things about the clouds of Elul was never revealed. The timing of John the Baptist and him coming to make the Messiah known to Israel to prepare the way of the king who was going to show up at the Jordan River and suddenly he was there. So we need to be sharing with those whose hearts are open to the true Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, Yeshua, the Messiah, the only true hope of Israel and the world. So on the new moon of Elul, God said to Moses, Ascend the mountain to me, and instructed the people in the camp to sound the shofar as a reminder to stay faithful and not to worship idols. In this way, God was elevated through the shofar blast, and the Jewish sages established the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Kodesh Elul, which is the first two days of Elul. And in every year, and for the entire month of Elul, in order to warn Israel to repent. So that's why John the Baptist was in the Jordan River telling the Israel people to repent. And Amos reminds us, is the shofar ever sounded in a city and the people not tremble? That's Amos 3.6. Sound of the shofar goes up and God ascends throughout Elul. There is everywhere in all creation the presence of God and the proximity of the divine to humankind is ever so accentuated as the spirituality of Elul. God is both in the field and approachable and elevated by human faithfulness. Perhaps Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik's profound observation that the shofar melts away God's strict disciplinary judgment and leaves only his overriding love and mercy and sensitivity helps us to understand the priority of this Ola over the shaktat of our verse. So the Jewish Midrash, Tehillim, explains that God is elevated through the shofar. God has ascended with the teruah blast see psalm 47 6 because through the shofar's teruah the name elohim which is the name of god meaning justice ascends and becomes the name yud he vav he which is the divine attribute of mercy and also i want to point out that it's not y-h-w-h because there's no W in Hebrew. It is Y-H-V-H, which is yud He vav He, which is the divine attribute of mercy. And from the shofar of the desert, we only learn that the shofar sound prevents us from sinning. We still need to learn that the sound of the shofar awakens a person to repent. After the miracle of the crossing of the sea, Moses and Israel sing praises to the Lord. The introduction to the verse, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song, is when interpreted from the perspective of rabbinic Hebrew. There is a Hasidic parable that I would read here. It says, during the season of repentance, and particularly on Yom Kippur, God is envisaged as father and king. Hasidic reflection sees God as the king in the field during Elul, drawn out of concealment and approachable. Rabbi Schneur Zalman, in his Liktui Torah, explains the Hasidic teaching of the approachableness of God during Elul. 
The teaching takes the form of a parable. A king normally lives in a palace, separated from and unapproachable by ordinary people. This is how our relationship with God seems as we become bound up in the world with its distractions, frailties, and concerns. During Elul, however, the king, God, might be experienced as having left the hiddenness of the palace and having entered into the field, the place where ordinary people are. And Jesus said the field is the world, again, and so becoming available to his subjects and in this month of Elul while people continue with their normal activities they are at the same time aware of the presence of God and are drawn to prayer reflection and response this parable like the truth of Hasidic philosophy invites us to enter a period of personal reflection where our ultimate goal is to uncover the divine point which is within this is the holy point within every person's heart, the living soul which is partnered with the divine eternal and which in the course of everyday life becomes covered and hidden. So we're kind of taken into the clouds and covered by the cloud and we enter it and we're hidden. During Elul we are the ones who come into the field seeking the king and it is during Elul that we turn to prayer and seek to draw close to God, remembering the divine attributes of mercy and forgiveness, which are the key factors of the month of Elul. According to the Sefet Emet, it is in our divine point that God has implanted eternal life in us, and it is this divine point which we must seek to uncover in order that we might be renewed, released from our sinful and imperfect selves, and to seek forgiveness for transgression, especially against one's fellows. It is the belief in Jewish tradition that God does not forgive sins committed against another person unless one first endeavors to be reconciled with those wronged. During Elul, the last month before the days of awe, Jews, mindful of the great sin of the golden calf, enter into a spiritual and practical cleansing which will culminate with Yom Kippur. So what I really wanted to talk about was this scripture, Psalm 27, that is read during the month of Elul. Now, I told you that this is when God created the world and he spoke, let there be light, and there was light. So Jesus the Messiah was born on Tishri 1 and was the light that came into the world and shined in the darkness. And the darkness was in the world, but the darkness could not comprehend him. So I wanted to say that the first line of Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. So how ironic is that verse when he came and descended into the world on Tishri 1 at Feast of Trumpets during the coronation of the king and he appeared suddenly and the people, the darkness, could not comprehend him. So they are reading Psalm 27, which means the Lord is my light and my Yeshua. The Midrash suggests the first verse, God is my light and my helper, or God is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear, alludes to the high holy days, God is my light on Rosh Hashanah. And that's when the light was created by God, speaking the light into existence. So there came a shout in the Jordan River of John baptizing the Messiah when he appeared suddenly in the field and the Spirit of God descended from heaven when the door of heaven or the gate of heaven was open. So the light was shining at that moment too upon him and you know he was the light that shined out of Galilee of the nations. So it alludes to the high holy days. God is my light on Rosh Hashanah and my salvation on Yom Kippur. So let me be clear about something. If you go to somebody's website and they're telling you that Jesus only fulfilled half the feast, that's wrong. 
He's fulfilled all of them. And when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. He fulfilled every single one of them. And on each one of those feast days, different events have happened over the centuries. So more will be fulfilled on those same days. So I just wanted to get that clarified in your mind so that you don't believe that he just did a halfway job. And it's ironic, and I wanted to read Psalm 27 because this is the verse that says, For he will hide me in his pavilion. And the Midrash says, in his sukkah. Now remember I was saying in the last video that Jesus at the time of Elul, when John was baptizing and the king appeared in the field to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and heaven was opened, it was Rosh Hashanah when the Spirit descended from heaven and stayed on him. So it was at this time that Jesus was speaking about the fig tree. And he told Nathaniel, Did you believe because I saw you sitting under the fig tree? Nathaniel asked him, How do you know me? Because he saw him in the future sitting under the fig tree. And there's a lot to this story, but what I can tell you about it is that I realize is he talking about that he saw him under the fig tree and it was a time in the future that it would be the fig tree generation when the resurrection rapture would happen, when we would all be brought in to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds of Elul. And the reason why I say this is because he was talking to him about the fig tree and that he saw him sitting there. And I told you in the last video, Jesus had said, did you believe because I saw you sitting under the fig tree? Because he, he recognized that Jesus is the king of Israel. He said, you are the king of Israel. Well, he said, did you believe because I saw you sitting under the fig tree, you shall see greater things than these. And what is the greater things? Because when the fig tree buds and all the trees, you know that the kingdom of heaven is near. And when John came baptizing, in uh, telling the people to repent, he was preparing them for the Feast of Trumpets when the king would suddenly appear. The door of heaven open. And so I now believe that he was revealing that the resurrection rapture would happen in the fig tree generation. And that's astounding to realize. Um, these are the greater things than him identifying him sitting under the fig tree. Because in the future, he's basically saying the resurrection rapture is going to happen when the king suddenly appears in the field and takes them into the clouds of Elul and the wise virgins are watching and have the oil in their lamps, which you do from watching my video that has the Holy Spirit revealing the things from the olive oil company. And, you know, the virgins that were not wise, what did the people say to them? Go and buy the oil for yourselves. And while they went to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in. That's us. We're ready and you are hearing this Holy Spirit oil revelation about Jesus' return for us in the glory clouds. So incredibly, we have all of this going on in the month of redemption. So I'm going to read to you Psalm 27. And because creation happened at the time of Rosh Hashanah and the light was created, when God spoke light into existence. This is what we have during this whole time period of Elul, reading Psalm 27 every morning. And it says, The Lord is my salvation, which is the meaning of Yeshua. This is a Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my Yeshua salvation. 
Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now listen, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. And this is the time that they sang for victory from the Red Sea crossing. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my Yeshua, salvation. When father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now the land of the living is when the resurrected dead come to life and they go in the glory cloud, this is, you know, like they're going into the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And Elul is all about getting right in your heart with God and drawing closer in your heart to him and having a true repentance and a closeness to him and, um, you know, just making him the focus of your world and your life and not the devices of this world. So all of this is going on. And to top it off with um, Psalm 27, when it says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Well, this day is also known as the hidden day. So he will hide me. We'll go up in the glory cloud. We'll be hidden with Christ, with the Messiah. Another name for Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hakisa, the day of the hiding or the hidden day. So I'm going to read this from BetAriel.org. The term Kisa is derived from the Hebrew root haka, which means to conceal, cover, or hide. Every day during the month of Elul, a trumpet is blown to warn the people to turn back to God, except for the 13th day of Elul, the day preceding Rosh Hashanah. On that day, the trumpet is not blown and is therefore silent. And this is because much about Rosh Hashanah is concealed and shrouded in mystery. The mystical aspect of Rosh Hashanah is indicated in scripture. Sound the shofar on the new moon. In concealment of the day of our festival, Satan the accuser is not to be given notice about the arrival of Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. So when this day comes, it's like you have the time to repent and then the judgment suddenly falls. So Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hakisa, or that day of the hiding, because it was hidden from Satan, the adversary. The Bible says that Satan comes to rob and to steal and to kill and destroy. 
Because it is the day of judgment, it is symbolically hidden from Satan. Satan did not know and understand the plan of the cross. This was hidden from him as well. Believers never said when the day of Rosh Hashanah was. They simply said, of that day and hour, no one knows, only the Father. Wow. So that's indicating that they said of that day and no one knows the hour, only the Father, to prevent Satan from knowing when Rosh Hashanah was going to happen. Because you know what? He's going to try to stop God from giving us the redemption during the month of redemption. So this was hidden from him. Again, saying of that day and hour, no one knows, only the Father. Now that's something I did not know and is just another thing being revealed here. One of the reasons most often given to disclaim that the resurrection of the dead and the catching away of the believers is on Rosh Hashanah is the statement given by Yeshua in Matthew 24, 36. As it is written, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Because Rosh Hashanah was understood to be the hidden day, this statement by Yeshua, the Messiah, is actually an idiom for Rosh Hashanah. Thus it should be given as proof that he was speaking of Rosh Hashanah because Rosh Hashanah is the only day in the whole year that was referred to as the hidden day or the day that no man knew. Rosh Hashanah takes place on the new moon, says that the new moon will teach about the Messiah. The Jewish biblical month is based upon a lunar cycle and the moon can barely be seen as the cycle begins. But then the moon turns towards the sun and begins to reflect the light of the sun. The sun in the sky is a picture of Yeshua, Malachi 4.2, and the moon is a picture of the believers in the Messiah. The sun has its own light, but the moon's light is a reflection of the sun. When we first become believers in Jesus, Yeshua, we can hardly be seen spiritually. But we know very little about God. But then our lives begin to revolve around the Messiah as the moon revolves around the sun. And as we begin to turn more and more towards the center of creation, we begin to reflect that light of Yeshua, Jesus. And... In Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And it says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you had the words, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me. Is that the time of Jacob's trouble? If you are a believer, you will be concealed with the Lord in the resurrection of the dead first that will rise up and go into the glory clouds of Elul and meet the Lord in the air and he shall hide you in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me he shall set me upon a rock so we have he shall hide me which is the word yesterday and that word also comes from Sathar, number 5641, to be absent, keep close, conceal, hide self, keep secret. Surely, a primitive root to hide by covering, literally or figuratively, be absent, keep close, conceal and hide, keep secret. And... Let's see if there's any other words here. It says undetected is another part of it. 
When you look up in Strong's Concordance in the secret place, you have number 5643, Kether, or Sather, a covering, hiding place, secrecy, hidden part, hidden place, disguises, shelter. And when it says, he shall hide me in his pavilion, it is 168 Ohel, covering, dwelling place, home, tabernacle, tent. So it is custom to recite Psalm 27 at the conclusion of the morning service, just after the shofar is sounded, and also at the end of the evening service, throughout the entire high holiday period from the first of Elul to Hoshana Rabbah. Some end the recitation of this psalm at Yom Kippur. So isn't that interesting that they would blow the shofar first? And this was the time that John came shouting in the wilderness to make the king, to make the people prepared to meet the king by, you know, taking a mikvah in the Jordan River, in the living water, and preparing themselves to meet the king suddenly because he was going to be in the field and they were about to meet the king. And it's after they blow the shofar that they read Psalm 27 that talks about in the time of trouble, God will hide them in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall lift me upon a rock. And the rock that followed the Hebrews in the wilderness was the Messiah. Incidentally, the church was built on the rock of the Messiah, not on Simon Peter. So we also see that part in Psalm 27 that says that I will offer sacrifices of joy to the Lord. So it's interesting if you go to Isaiah 26, 19, it says, But your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up. And what is the wake-up call but the shofar blast? And shout for joy. So those are the sacrifices of joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Could it be on the birthday of Yeshua on Tishri 1 at Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, that this is talking about the earth, when the earth was created, was on that day as well, will give birth to her dead? So they will become, they will come up out of the graves and meet the Lord in the clouds of Elul, because the king appears suddenly and descends, just like the Holy Spirit descended when the door of heaven was open and landed on him in the Jordan River at Yeshua's baptism, Jesus' baptism. So we see the dead waking up and shouting for joy and this happens in the morning, just like I told you in the last video, um, and the earth will give birth to her dead. Another translation of that's kind of interesting, the New Living Translation, but it says, But those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. Those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy. For your life-giving light will fall like dew on your people in the place of the dead. Is that not exciting? So, you know, the dead are going to rise up singing praising God with joy because you know when you think somebody your loved one is dead you think that they're never coming back you're never going to see them you know in the world this is what people believe and that it's over and it's a, a terrible loss it's a terrible separation which is the meaning of death uh, death is separation and that's why you know, if you're cast into the lake of fire, you're separated from God. You are eternally dead in your spirit and soul. And there's no hope. So I like that translation. And I want to give you 1 Thessalonians 4.16. This would be the New Living Translation. 
I usually use King James Version basically all the time, but I like some of the ways this is interpreted. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout. And that's what John the Baptist was doing to prepare the people because the king was suddenly going to arrive at the Jordan River and he was the one shouting in the wilderness, make straight a path for the Lord and he will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First the believers who have died will rise from their graves. And of course, we know the King James says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and that's in the clouds of Elul, I believe. The time of redemption. It's at that point... He will hide us in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. And it will be the time of Jacob's trouble. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Now Mark 12, 25 says, For when they shall rise from the dead... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So their body will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And isn't that exciting to add that to the resurrection from the scripture, that they will awaken at the sound of the shofar, and they will be singing and shouting for joy that they are alive, and that they have a new body that is incorruptible. Now interesting, if the rapture resurrection was to occur on Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, it's interesting that Ephesians 5.14 says this, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Messiah shall give thee light. And that's when he spoke light with his voice and commanded it with a shout, let there be light and there was light. And that is the birthday of the Messiah, the light that shined in the darkness. And so when the dead awake, they are singing and shouting joyful praises to God. And the Messiah is giving them light on the very day that God created the light. So, it's incredible that at the time of repentance, when John the Baptist came baptizing in the month of Elul, is the time that the clouds of Elul return, and we will be hidden during the hidden day from the time of trouble, and he will conceal us and secret us away in his pavilion, where we will be protected and kept safe because we were watching and waiting for our king to suddenly appear in the field and take us to where he is to the place that he's prepared for us now I can just imagine all of the graves of the believers bursting open and their bodies coming out of the graves and can you imagine the excitement of that if you, you know, had died and your soul and spirit were alive with him, but he's bringing them back down in their soul and spirit, and he's resurrecting their bodies to meet up with their soul and spirit so they have a whole new body to dwell in that's eternal. I can't imagine the joy of that. It would be really neat to be at my mother's grave at the Feast of Trumpets because if it happens at that time period, <laughs> I just can't imagine how thrilling that will be, but kind of terrifying for the rest of the people who don't get what's going on. And because you have oil in your lamps, because you're hearing these revelations of the Holy Spirit, that's revealing that it's more than likely the season that he will come in. Even though a lot of the different feasts that we've talked about in the past, 
they have elements that appear to be the time of the resurrection rapture. But the Jews always believed that the dead would rise from their graves at the Feast of Trumpets, and they would go visit the um, graves of their loved ones like the night before Rosh Hashanah, and they would put a rock on the grave. So he shall set me upon a rock. Well, he's the rock that raises the dead, and it's an eternal memorial to have our loved one's names written in the Book of Life. And this happens during Rosh Hashanah. L'shana tova tikitevu is may you be inscribed in the Book of Life for a sweet new year. And I'll leave off at this point knowing that not only the clouds of Elul, when the king descends from heaven and he's suddenly in your midst and you turn around and he's there and he greets you and you go to be with him in the clouds. Well, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh is born of the flesh, but Spirit is born of the Spirit. Do not be amazed that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone born of the Spirit. You will hear the sound of the shout and his shofar blast, but you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where we're going, except we're going to meet him in the glory cloud, which I believe is the clouds of Elul now. So I just wanted to share some more with you that this is the day of hiding us from the time of trouble and secreting us away to be hidden where he is, protected. And we are not destined for the wrath of God, but we've been given salvation. We've been given Yeshua in the Messiah. So give your heart to him, draw close to him, repent of your sins and get closer to him and keep the oil in your lamps by listening to people that are preaching the word of God and telling you that the time is getting close, that we're at the end, we're, we're on the last of the last days. I mean, why are all these people saying this unless God is directing people to be saying, get ready, wake up, with the shofar blast of Elul on every day, read Psalm 27 and know that he loves you and he's the bridegroom. He is the beloved and we are his bride and we're going to draw close to him because he's soon going to appear in the field, in the clouds of Elul and take us at the shout and the trumpet call of God. I can't wait. And, you know, just thinking of the dead coming out of their graves and singing and shouting because they're overjoyed that they're no longer in the grave. Can you imagine that? And it's getting ready to come. Now, I want to make sure there will always be people that misinterpret. I want to make sure that you don't think that I'm saying this is the year or, you know, whatever. I'm showing you revelations from this season that we are now in and how all the things are pointing to the resurrection rapture. And I'm not saying it's going to happen this year per se, but at some point it is going to happen and the Holy Spirit is revealing so much right now with the olive oil. <laughs> and I just think it's amazing. So keep watching. Thank you for so many people that watched my last video. And please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That helps the algorithms. And um, support this channel. I really could use some support and help. I hope you're blessed by everything the Holy Spirit's been revealing. Keep your lamps burning. Because the King is going to appear suddenly in the world. And He is coming to... Take us in the glory cloud. And I can't wait. Hope I'm worthy. God help me to be ready. In Jesus' name.